um, today. Um, I'm going to use the results of a recent SCAPE project called Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk um, and offer it as an example of the potential of empirical data collected through long-term monitoring programs um, to contribute to current research into the impacts of climate change upon earth processes, in our case, coastal processes. And um, you can read the full report and all the data is available here to download. So first things first, um, 20, around 20% of Scotland's 21,000 kilometre long coastline um, is defined as soft and low lying. By soft, um, generally sandy, and so by definition susceptible to coastal erosion. Although for archaeological heritage, um, this, does that work? Yeah, 78 hard and mixed. Um, this, is, this is also um, very important at the scales archaeologists work in. Um, a significant proportion of vulnerable sites are located in hard and mixed coasts, which are quite poorly captured in, in models of coastal vulnerability generally. Now, I'm sure you've already talked about sea level rise already this morning. Um, tide gauge records reveal that sea level rise in Scotland, as in everywhere else, is rising. Um, this is um, recent research by Jim Hansen and co. Um, but we're looking at Scotland's sea level rise tracking um, a high emission scenario. Um, however, in Scotland, um, situated in the Atlantic, in the northwest, in northwest Europe, our geography means that wind and waves are far more significant factors now when we're looking at um, heritage loss and coastal vulnerability of archaeological sites. And some of our most iconic sites, of course, have been re revealed by storms in the past. So Scarra Bray, revealed in a storm in the 19th century, is probably the most famous example, possibly in the world. Um, but also this is Balisha in the Western Isles, revealed in a storm in 2005. Here we have a, a newly discovered Broch on Shetland, revealed in 2012, 11, 12. And then a long-running project we've been doing in, in the Highlands in East Sutherland of Brora. This is what it looked like in 2009. That was underneath the sand dune. Um, and this is what it looks like after a storm event in 2012. So that's what storms do to archaeological sites in very vulnerable, soft, sandy, uh, unconsolidated coastal areas. Now, Scotland has very good baseline data collected through coastal zone assessment surveys. But as you can see here, there's a, a, a very large number of records and um, a lot of um, recommendations within those records for mitigation action to um, address the issue of coastal erosion. And in fact, um, these were done, but the last one was done in 2010, and there were so many recommendations for action that it probably acted as a bit of a barrier to action because the problem was just too, too, too big. So also in 2010, my colleague Tom, um, as a first step towards transforming this database um, into more of a management resource, he applied quite a, a straightforward risk assessment methodology to pull out the most archaeologically significant sites um, that were being impacted by coastal erosion. And um, Tom's desk-based analysis of inspection-based data, he was using um, survey data, ended up with uh, 322 sites of, of the very highest priority and another 500 or so are recommended for monitoring. Now, we at SCAPE recognise this as an opportunity to involve local communities in the updated... Well, I should, should have said, Tom recommended in every case that the sites that he prioritised should have another visit to see what their condition was now because the data he was working with was 10 to 15 years old in, in many cases. So we um, used our experience of working with local communities to harness that knowledge and capacity um, to address a national issue really through a local lens because local people, they know their local coastlines, they're on hand to monitor change and they also bring in a lot of additional knowledge and experience that we can use in our coastal records. So this is where um, Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk project came from. The technology we developed was simply just to provide the mechanism for people to access their records of coastal features in their area and to participate and contribute up, um, updates. So we put everything onto an interactive map and an app. Um, and then Ellie and I embarked on really a three-year intensive um, cycle of face-to-face -face training, um, which is absolutely critical because we need to 
um, build a relationship with our volunteers, um, otherwise basically our data will be very poor. I mean, that's the bottom line. So over the, over, over the four years of the project, um, we had 1,200 volunteers involved in project activities, around half of those in the coastal surveys, and they, they submitted 1,041 updates of sites. Um, they found 400 new sites, and very um, usefully, we managed to visit 90% of the 322 sites that Tom had pulled out as the highest priority. So that gave us a very good data set to work with. Um, Ellie and I moderated records as they came in, um, and towards the end of the project, we systematically went through every, uh, every um, report submitted, and we um, reviewed their priorities based upon uh, our current understanding of the site significance and the actual threat of erosion. Um, so the resulting priorities that, we ca that came out of SHARP um, are the result of two cycles of inspection data, and so it's really a very robust empirical data set. Um, our results um, showed that uh, the total number of priority sites um, were reduced by around half, but that the proportion of priority sites against the whole remained similar. Um, unsurprisingly, Shetland, Orkney, parts of the Highlands and the Western Isles, because of their location in relation to North Atlantic storm tracks, um, they retained the most numbers of highly vulnerable um, and also significant sites. Now, most of our sites are located in low-lying, soft, sandy coastlines, um, but uh, 20, nearly, 20, nearly a quarter of our sites are located in low-lying areas that would be um, described as hard coast or on mixed coast. Um, so this is important because these hard coastlines um, are really not captured in, in more geographic models of coastal vulnerability. Um, so this is just an example of a site in Newark on Sandy in Orkney of one of our sort of soft coast um, vulnerable sites. There's a building there eroding out of, as you can see, a very unconsolidated sand dune. And also on Sandy, here's an example of a site on a low-lying hard or mixed coast. And here we've got rock platform with a, a till veneer and just a, a little tiny bit of soft sediment. And the archaeology is all, all in here. And there's, you know, there's probably at least 100 meters of this site. So while there's a fewer priority sites, well, at least 10%, um, we can account for those because they have been either fully excavated or conserved. Um, a very important um, reason for the reduction in numbers is that SHARP was introduced national parity to what were carried out as regional surveys. So that's very important. Um, in the Western Isles, um, the coastal zone assessment surveys were done following a, a hurricane event. So they were recording um, the aftermath of a massive storm event which had revealed um, coast, a lot of archaeological sites at the coast. The um, SHARP surveys were done 15 years, 10 years later, um, and so we were looking at the intervening period of stabilisation. So that doesn't mean we took them off any list, it just means we reduced their their urgency of action status to from urgent now to monitor, okay? So we're picking up natural cycles. Um, the value of using local people in surveys is that we get a lot of information about what's happening locally, so um, land management um, is probably could account for um, more stabilisation of um, soft, particularly sandy areas, and people did talk about lower stock numbers and just improve management of fragile landscapes. Um, people also told us about that there were, not everywhere, but in some places, people said, well, there are less rabbits around, which is very important in Maca landscapes. Um, and we did a little bit of follow-up looking into this, and you might have caught this in the press about in, in, there was in May, um, because of this internal hemorrhagic disease that's hit um, certainly the UK um, Scottish rabbits population has reduced by 82% since 1995. Bear in mind the Coastal Zone Assessment Surveys started in 1995 and our SHARP surveys were sort of 10, 20 years later. So um, I think that's probably a factor there. And also we looked at meteorological trends, um, in particular storminess. <coughs> 
So here, this um, is a storm index for the British Isles, the North Sea, and the Norwegian Sea based on pressure data. Um, and there's only a couple of things I want you to, you to take away from this graph. First, firstly, the randomness of weather records, um, and then a point made by the authors that um, you can argue the case for decreasing or increasing storminess, really depending um, on where you draw your line on your time scales. Important to bear in mind when we're talking about storminess. Um, but there is a trend of elevated storminess, and this is backed up by most, not all, but most studies. The storminess in this region peaks in the late 19th century and again around 1990. So the coastal zone assessment surveys were carried out from 1995 onwards. The sharp surveys were carried out 10 to 15 years later. So it's just possible that we're picking up um, a stabilization um, which is the result of natural meteorological cycles, particularly in sandy areas. And this is supported by, by, wider, by wider research into sand, sand dunes, for example. So we're now at a stage in Scotland where we have at least two cycles of empirical data for the coastal zone assessment survey areas, which is about 35% of the coast. And whether as a result of meteorological trends or coastal management changes or biological factors, and probably a combination of all three, our results are detecting a wider trend of coastal change. Um, in this case, stabilisation, but this could change very rapidly into destabilisation. What matters is that our network of coastal heritage sites are, are seeming to act as a proxy for wider trends of coastal change. And this is important because going forward, our coastal heritage data can really step up and have a role in research into the how, how the results of climate change, sea level rise or change in weather patterns, are affecting coastal processes and our coastlines. And this is applicable to all long-term condition, condition monitoring data sets, which are routinely collected by our, our heritage agencies, because not only do, do they tell us about change to the heritage asset, um, if we aggregate our data, it could have an important role in describing and understanding or explaining the effects of climate change upon Earth processes that interact with our historic environment. Thank you.